Hello and welcome back um, to many of you. It's this is the fourth presentation of the Friends of the Library Book Sandwiched In series for 2022. I apologize again for last week's technical difficulties. Deb and Michael have re recorded that presentation and it's available um, both at the library's Facebook page and uh, on the YouTube page. So I would recommend if you were one of the people who did not tough it out, uh, <laughs> that you might want to go back and, and um, look at that. It turns out we were trying to present from upstairs in the library because the library is so busy with many people using our meeting rooms, but we had conflicting Wi-Fi systems. Is that's all we can think of anyway? That that made us get booted off and and have so many sound pro problems. So I'm hoping um, that this will be much better. I'm Louise Richardson, chair of the Book Sandwiched In Committee for this year. Once again, I'd like to thank the other committee members for their good work. Margot Brown, Barbara Cook, Lisa Derrickson, Dusty Hewitt, Gary McCaslin, and Pam Sonnefeld. Pam Sonnefeld, sorry. We are always looking for book lovers to join us in the selection process. If you're interested, you can email the friends, and I've put that uh, email address in the chat. It's friends of sscllibrary at gmail.com. And if you don't want to commit to being on the committee, that's fine. But if you read something that you think would just be a perfect book for 2023, you can send that along too. Today's presenter is Kathy Patterson. She's a re retired history and government teacher who taught at the high school level in Corning for 27 years. You, some of you will remember that Kathy presented My Dear Hamilton, a historical novel about Eliza Schuyler Hamilton at Book Sandwiched In several years ago. She'll be presenting The Lincoln Highway by Amor Towles. The publisher has also tagged this as an historical novel. Yikes, it's set in 1953, and that's during the lifetime of at least a few of us on this call today. It is indicative of the popularity of this author that the library system has 41 copies representing every format. So if you haven't read it, you can get the book, the large print book, a book on CD, the audio book, or an ebook. We'll keep everyone muted during this presentation, but we'll keep the mics open afterward and hope you'll join with discussion. You can also put any questions or comments in the chat if that works better for you. Thanks so much for enduring one more Zoom meeting to join us today. We hope to see you again next week for Corey McCall's presentation on Patrick Redden Keefe's Empire of Pain. And here's Kathy. Unmute, oh, I don't want to. I've always been interested in making a grand entrance, so I guess uh, this is it. Thank you for the kind introduction, uh, very generous uh, of Louise. I also, um, my first book that I reviewed was about uh, Louisa Adams, and that's been probably four or five years ago. And uh, this is an experience that I've enjoyed and I was a little bit, uh, felt it, this might be a little more daunting because it was uh, a fictional work. So this is something new and, um, but it, something that I enjoyed a great deal. I didn't know there were 41 different ways to, um, ways to access the novel from the library. And I'm guessing that many of you have probably read it. Um, as Louise said, the, the setting is um, 10 days in 1954. Um, and Louise, if you would advance the slide there. Um, the, the genres that this book has been classified into include um, historical fiction, which to me is a little bit of a stretch. Um, 
adventure. Uh, it certainly is that uh, coming of age story. And a term that I was not familiar with until uh, I started doing some research about this book, it's considered a picaresque novel. Um, a picaresque novel uh, depicts the adventures of a roguish but appealing hero, um, maybe of low social class who lives by his wits. It features a lot of satire, comedy, uh, sarcasm, and social criticism, which I think uh, if you've read the book, it does fit all of those uh, features. Um, the clearest other example that people might be familiar with would be Huckleberry Finn. And um, certainly, you know, that could be classified as pic picaresque also. So we've got these 10 days in June of 1954. Um, I think the, the author selected this time period because it was cons considerable time after World War II and the Korean War, but um, really before people were entirely preoccupied with the Cold War. So there weren't some of the dis uh, many distractions that you might have found from you know, another time frame. <clears throat> The story focuses on four, I think, main characters. And I think there's another slide here, please. Um, uh, Emmett Watson, uh, Duchess Hewitt, and Willie Martin, all 18-year-olds who have met at a juvenile work camp in Salina, Kansas. <clears throat> As, and then the fourth um, musketeer, as he liked to frame it, was Emmett's eight-year-old brother, Billy. <clears throat> as the novel begins, Emmett is being driven home uh, by the Salina Warden Williams, a somewhat progressive sort of warden from the work farm. Emmett has been released early because Emmett and Billy's father has passed away after suffering from cancer. Their mother had left the family in 1946. So she had been absent for uh, some time. And Emmett is returning to Morgan, Nebraska to take over caring for Billy and to decide what he's gonna do with the rest of his life. The farm that his father had been so unsuccessful with has been foreclosed on. And given his crime, as the warden says, uh, the result of the darker side of chance, making a fresh start as a carpenter in a new community seemed like an attractive option. After researching the best place to take up this profession, either Texas or California, uh, he settles on California because that's where the population growth is going to be the greatest and there will be much need for uh, housing and the work of a carpenter there. But alas, Wooly and Duchess, two Salina buddies who had stowed away in the trunk of the warden's car, appear out of nowhere as Emmett and Billy are checking out Emmett's 1948 baby blue Studebaker, which has been stored in the barn so the stage is set for a journey which will feature uh, its share of U-turns. What is the significance of the title of the novel, The Lincoln Highway? Um, Louise, if you would uh, advance here, please, thank you. So California, particularly um, the, perhaps San Francisco or the area around San Francisco was a destination. Surprisingly, Tolls discovered the existence of the Lincoln Highway um, after beginning this book. And I must confess that I discovered the existence of the Lincoln Highway upon reading the book. As uh, he began, he intentionally located the Watsons' home and farm in Nebraska, about 1,500 miles 
from the East Coast and the West Coast. But as he was doing research for the book, he realized that this road, which was the first transcontinental highway, <clears throat> began in Times Square in New York City and ended in San Francisco at the Palace of the Legion of Honor. Construction of the highway was begun by Carl Fisher in 1913 with the help of private donations, which that's kind of a shocking uh, point. Um, statues of Abraham Lincoln can be found at various locations along the route and are a major attraction for some of the novel's uh, characters. This seemed like a logical tie-in to the story. Um, I think there's another Lincoln Highway slide there. So this is, I think the way it looks today, um, it's not completely connected anymore, uh, but I think it's Route 80 that makes up uh, a portion of what was the Lincoln Highway. So because of, the, of this logical tie-in, um, he used this as the title, but the highway itself plays a very, very small part in the story, although young Billy is its greatest proponent. Most of the action takes place along other pathways, while Emmett and Billy travel much of the distance to New York in a freight car via the railway. Um, another interesting tie-in, and I think this is the next slide, Louise, uh, is that Toll purchased postcards of places along the Lincoln Highway, and these are woven into the story as well. It seems like Mrs. Watson, who had deserted the family, sent a series of postcards back to them from similar locations. And Billy, at least, was convinced that she could be found in San Francisco, where the road ended, and where there were spectacular fireworks every Fourth uh, of July, something that she um, had seemed to enjoy. Though it's brother didn't share the same sense of hope in finding this mother, uh, Billy's quest was another motivation to take that Lincoln Highway to California. Uh, so I think the, the one postcard on the right is actually the first postcard that is um, mentioned in the story as a place where uh, Mrs. Watson stopped after she left the family, which is always the reason for which is somewhat of a mystery. Um, I attribute it to severe um, depression after the birth of Billy. May or may not be true. That's just speculation. Okay, next slide. Please. The, oh, the baby blue Studebaker, um, which will undergo its own transformation, I might say, <laughs> before the end of the story. Okay, now, <clears throat> in addition to the four major characters, um, there are a number of minor characters, some of which actually play rather major roles. Um, Warden Williams, who I've already um, spoken about, who seemed to have a soft spot for those who were at the work camp he supervised. Um, Sally Ransom, who was Emmett and Billy's next door neighbor and who Billy stayed with um, after the death of their father. Um, Mr. Packer and Mr. Parker, I always, that's sort of a tricky uh, combination, who they met on the train, uh, they had a nice, fancy Pullman car and their, their um, little appearance is, is kind of fascinating. Uh, Ulysses, uh, who was the first black person that Billy had ever met, who they meet on the train, and whose name I might add is very significant. Um, Pastor John, who is the embodiment of evil, if you've ever um, want to see it. Uh, Willie's sister and her husband, Sarah and Dennis, whose name always appeared in 
quotation marks, I think um, that was meant to be a, a slam on uh, Dennis and his ambition. And of course, Professor Abacus Abernathy, um, who each take their own journeys and their journeys will intersect with our four musketeers in often surprising ways. Interestingly, there are only two females in the group. Um, next slide, please, Louise. Sally um, and Sarah. And I, I think you could say they both um, are in rather traditional women's roles for that time frame. Uh, Sally, however, had her own ambitions and future to pursue and demonstrated some strong feminist leanings. Uh, Wooly's sister, Sarah's future, had already been pretty much set. Uh, she was the dutiful wife of ladder climbing banker at JP Morgan's, Dennis. They lived in the posh neighborhood in Hastings on Hudson and were expecting their first child. There were some other um, female figures in the uh, novel, notably some ladies of the evening who ensnare Emmett uh, a little bit later, uh, which proves to be only a minor setback. So while the absence of strong female characters might be seen as a shortcoming, um, it's really fitting uh, for that particular time frame. So I guess uh, we could say it's historically accurate. Thanks. The novel is organized into 10 books with numerous chapters uh, within each one. And each is told from the perspective of the various characters, each chapter that is. These books are numbered in reverse order from 10 to one, which was kind of puzzling to me at first. Um, but Tolls has said that he rewrote uh, the book so that it would be backwards in that way. The arrangement was done because it was to be a countdown to the conclusion of the book. Coincidentally, it took 10 days to make the trip from Nebraska to the Adirondacks where the story finishes. Another use of 10 involved Billy, who was concerned about Emmett's hot tempered nature and encouraged him to count to 10 to cool off when he found himself becoming upset. A practice he might have used to avoid the incident that sent him to the work farm in Salina. Uh, there, I think one of the um, strong points about the novel is the use of uh, different perspectives. Tolls originally planned to just use the perspectives of Emmett and Duchess, who, and Duchess, I think we can say, really drives so much of the story. But the voices of others asserted themselves as the book was written, um, especially these pairs of uh, characters, Pastor John and Ulysses, um, who again, that most of that action will take place on the train. Uh, Sally and Wooly, brother and sister, uh, who have some similar personality characteristics. And uh, Professor Abernathy and Billy, um, who talked about many things, including the answer to the question, do you think heroes return? As one reads from chapter to chapter, the perspective changes from Emmett to Wooly or from Billy to Pastor John to Ulysses, for example. As many of the chapters end, the reader is teased as to what might be going to happen next. 
Sometimes this might be revealed in the very next chapter, narrated by another character, or it could happen several chapters away. This heightened my interest to learn what the next development or revelation would be. And often a new issue would pre present itself before the previous one was resolved. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. please. So <clears throat> if we're gonna make an argument for this being a historical fiction uh, work, um, there are a couple of things to hang your hat on, I suppose. I was curious about the one photograph which appeared in the book, which is this picture that you see on the left. Um, <clears throat> this was another sort of lucky discovery of tolls uh, from dated from June 14th, 1954. As part of a civil defense drill, all activity in New York City and other large US cities was to stop for a period of 10 minutes. In the photo, you can see Times Square uh, all but abandoned. Um, so th that was a real event. <clears throat> Another reference to the nuclear threat uh, is connected to Billy. It seems that during uh, the duck and cover classroom drills of the era, he refused to participate, having figured out that the futility figured out the futility of trying to avoid um, a nu nuclear radiation in this way. Clearly, this was a real concern for those living during the time. I couldn't help but remember when I was um, teaching world history and we would be talking about this particular era and you would see, you know, um, films or documentaries or see pictures of the duck and cover grills, my students always thought that was, you know, completely ridiculous, uh, similar to, to Billy. But I, you know, I think we might agree that the purpose of the drills was maybe not so much to be protected from radiation, but to give the appearance that you were trying to do something um, to answer this nuclear threat. Uh, next slide there, Louise, I think. The other uh, sort of nod, it's more to cultural history, um, I think were the uh, Howard Johnson's restaurants that are visited by Willie and Duchess um, at various points in the story. And um, especially loved by Willie, who had traveled all over the world and probably eaten at a lot of exotic places, but was completely enthralled with the, with the experience at uh, Howard Johnson's, especially the map that was used as a place that uh, of map of Illinois. A prominent role in the novel is played by, there's the Howard Johnsons. Um, so the, a prominent role in the novel is played by an object, a book given to Billy by the local librarian in Morgan. You've really got to love the perception of librarians. She must have noticed that he needed to have some positive role models um, which were written about in this book, uh, given all the traumatic experiences that Billy had already had. So this book, uh, Abacus Abernathy's Compendium of Heroes, Adventurers, and Other Intrepid Travelers, and that title is quite a mouthful. This was Billy's constant companion evidenced by the fact that he'd read it 25 times. The work was comprised of the stories of fictional and non-fictional characters, 26 in all, one for each letter of the alphabet, from Achilles to Zorro, Daniel Boone to George Washington, and, and notably including Ulysses. The one letter without a heroic figure was Y, 
reserved for you, the reader, to write your own story. The question for Billy would be, at what point in his life should he begin to do this? Such is probably a valid question for any of us. When Billy actually gets to meet Professor Abernathy later in the novel, to his great delight, I might add, uh, he gets some advice about how to answer that question. I was also struck by Emmett's le less than enthusiastic um, embrace of this compendium. Isn't it hard enough to tell fact from fiction, he remarked, disapproving of the inclusion of the legendary and mythical figures. I think given our own um, political climate uh, currently, this is a question for our age as well. Um, yet certainly the lives of mythical heroes can offer valuable lessons. Related to this, I'd like to share the path that Amor Tolls has taken to develop his writing style. He gives much credit where shall wisdom be found with putting writing on more solid ground. Bloom asked the question, in what books does one find wisdom in order to better understand and gain command over what it means to be human? So Tolls resolved to read more accomplished, rich books and began meeting with three friends to discuss these works. These books, which people from various backgrounds and walks of life can be engaged with and touched by, include Emerson, Thoreau, Melville, and Whitman. And um, I think these next slides just feature um, a few of their pictures, Emerson and Thoreau and then Melville and Walt Whitman. That Tolls engaged in this kind of disciplined approach is very much evident in the style and substance of his writing. Um, throughout the book, there are references to these writers as well as to Homer, the obvious connection to the Odyssey and to I think this is the next slide, uh, Louise, and to Shakespeare, who's frequently quoted by Duchess as he recalls the early work of his father, who had been a Shakespearean actor in his heyday. And there's so much more about his father that will be interesting for you to find out if you haven't read the book already. Whether or not the Lincoln Highway leads readers to find wisdom, which perhaps is Toll's um, objective, remains an open question for each individual. As for me, I found the book immensely enjoyable. Though the precocious Billy was my favorite character, there were others I found myself rooting for, including Wooly, Sally, Emmett, and even, even Duchess at times, who perhaps has the saddest um, story of all. Their different perspectives were engaging to read, especially when there was a new point that was revealed or you were questioning how a certain um, issue was going to be resolved later on. For me, it was a bit of a stretch to consider this historical fiction, yet I did appreciate uh, Toll's inclusion of aspects of life that were specific to the mid 1950s. I must confess that when our family visited Howard Johnson's, that was always a lot of fun for me too, particularly the delicious brown bread um, and fried clams, which were my favorites. 
there, there are a few passages where the action seems to drag, but these are short lived and don't detract from the overall um, story. As we continue to struggle with the pandemic, with the economic disruptions caused by it, and with divisions in our country, it seems like stories, the stories of friendship, promise, and nostalgia, uh, like those that are featured in the Lincoln Highway have special appeal. We identify with the characters and their tragic flaws because we have them too. Like so many of these characters, we often find ourselves on our own journeys to make a fresh start. And uh, there are just two kind of digressions um, I'm going to take here because um, we have a little bit of time. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I don't, I'm going to just show you my book with, with all of these post-it notes in it. And I'm hoping that there is a student somewhere out there who might tune in and look at this because they know how much of a proponent of uh, making notes uh, on their reading I was. And so I want them to see that there are copious um, notes along with uh, the book. But there's a passage um, later in the book that Wooly's sister, um, <clears throat> Sarah, some impressions that I think that I would like to share. <clears throat> she says, when we're young, so much time is spent teaching us the importance of keeping our vices in check, our anger, our envy, our pride. But when I look around, it seems to me that so many of our lives end up being hampered by a virtue instead. If you take a trait that by all appearances is a merit, a trait that is praised by pastors and poets, a trait that we have come to admire in our friends <clears throat> and hope to foster in our children, and you give some poor soul it in abundance, it will almost certainly prove an obstacle to their happiness. Just as someone can be too smart for their own good, there are those who are too patient for their own good or too hardworking. Those who are too confident or too cautious, or too kind. Emmett understood that what Mrs. Whitney was sharing with him was her effort to understand, to explain, to make some sense of the undoing of her big-hearted brother. At the same time, <clears throat> Emmett suspected that tucked in Mrs. Whitney's list was an apology for her husband who was either too smart, too confident, or too hardworking for his own good, perhaps all three. But what Emmett found himself wondering was what virtue did Mrs. Whitney have too much of? The answer his instincts told him, though he was almost reluctant to admit it, was probably forgiveness. And Again, as you as you read the story, you will see how you know that uh, is true. So I think I think it's the next slide, uh, Louise. Yes, the. Now, my other digression has to do with this recipe uh, for fettuccine mio amore. And this was um, served uh, in the home of Sarah and Dennis by Duchess to the four musketeers plus Sally uh, towards the end of the novel. And <clears throat> Come to find out, it is a real recipe that Amor Tolls 
got from an Italian friend who always complained about how Americans fixed Italian food. <clears throat> so um, if you keep scrolling there, Louise, you'll see if you're looking for something new for dinner this evening, there's the recipe um, for this dish that appears in the, in the novel. And I understand in one of other Toll's um, novels, he has a recipe, I believe it's for some kind of stew. I can't remember which one it is, but perhaps some of you um, might remember. Um, I, think, I think we're near the end. <clears throat> we, we might do well to remember a quote from Emerson that Emmett's father uh, left in a letter uh, to Emmett and that he read, life is a, a journey, not a destination. Um, the picture here is of the Palace of the Legion of Honor in San Francisco, which was supposed to be their destination, in which I think we could say they didn't advance one mile uh, towards during um, the novel. Uh, like the Watson brothers, we may not reach our destinations on time or at all, or like them, we may end up going in some opposite direction, but that certainly doesn't mean we won't find richness and fulfillment as we make our journey through life. Um, and certainly when I think about my own example, I would never have thought I would have ever lived for 30 some years in Corning, New York, um, and had some of the events that I enjoyed take place. Uh, but I am very grateful for um, those events and the way things have turned out. Uh, I'll briefly mention uh, a couple of other books of Amor Tolls, in case you haven't read them, or go ahead, the next one, Louise. Um, if, if you are curious about them, Rules of Civility was his first novel, and A Gentleman in Moscow, <clears throat> I think that might have been the one with the stew recipe. Oh, you've done that, if, okay, interesting. Uh, so I've not read either one of those books, but you might be interested to um, know that on Toll's uh, website, I recently read that um, he's one of only a few popular authors who sends readers to IndieBound to purchase their books before um, Amazon on the list. So uh, this is a nod to small booksellers uh, who many writers give lip service to, but uh, probably don't promote to the same extent. So if I'm guessing our library has copies of these as well, uh, but if you want your own copy, um, you can feel free to access them on indie books sometime. Okay. So I think this is the point where we do some questions or comments. Right, so I'm relocating next to Kathy so that we don't get that dueling microphone thing that we've had in the past. So I'm hoping this works. So do I um, need to leave? No, don't drink. Um, okay. So we did have a couple of comments so far in the chat. Um, Peggy tells us the Lincoln Highway is Route 30. And if you want to look in the chat, Grace has put um, a link to the Lincoln Highway Association's history page. So there's some um, more information if you're interested. So any comments or questions from anyone? Come on. Yay, Lisa. So um, this is really nerdy. 
but it struck me when I was reading the book that the author doesn't use quotation marks around speech. He just starts it with a dash and then the, you know, the conversation, the words that the, that the character says, and then, you know, he, he will identify who it is, but it's not a bunch of quotations. So, you know, being sort of nerdy about language and, and quotation marks and uh, punctuation and things like that, that struck me. And then later, near the end of the book, um, the character Wooly actually talks about punctuation. And Wooly is just the dearest person. And his nickname is based on his last name, but he yeah. really is kind of fuzzy. He's not yes. the right. sharp guy, but he's very sweet and gentle and um, often gets taken by, you know, this personality that he has. And, and he talks about um, punctuation and how it was so difficult for him as a student to understand punctuation. And finally, a teacher helped him by saying, you know, punctuation just um, highlights what someone is going to say, what is important in what they say. And he's thinking all of this as he's sitting in the study of his brother-in-law, Dennis, who's a real jerk, and is getting ready to really um, <laughs> read the riot act yes. to Wooly. And he just takes this like mental um, byway, you know, talking about punctuation, thinking about punctuation. And I just like that the author really went back to that punctuation issue. Um, and poor Wooly gets like dressed down, you know, but he's like in his own world. So he's not <laughs> taking it too badly. He just says, I can see that Dennis doesn't really even need punctuation because it's very clear that what he's going to say is very important. Right. Uh, in terms of the comment about the um, lack of quotation marks, I think that from the some of the reading that I did, that was a, a that bothered a lot of people that there weren't, you know, the the uh, quotation marks. But I've read a few things. And again, going back to um, teaching, one of the books uh, our students read was Cry the Beloved Country. And <clears throat> I believe that bothered them too, because it was written in the same kind of style uh, with the dialogue. They, they had a hard time keeping up with the dialogue because it was written that way. Yeah, so. I think more and more are. Um, so Margo asked, if I could put the recipe in the chat, which I have done. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard to read on the PowerPoint. Link out to that. Ah, uh, Dennis. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Um, I listened to the book on CD, so it, these some of these things I'm just learning. Um, uh, for those of you who read it. I'm looking at this recipe and it really looks like my grandma's goulash uh, um, because she always used bacon. So I'm gonna try this, looks good. <laughs> um, but as I just so enjoyed the book and it was, you know, a, a point, I was born in 1954. So I figured it was sort of my time frame, And I went to, uh, to Howard Johnson's a lot and had those fried <laughs> clams. But you know, it was, what was wonderful about it was uh, there, there, I kept expecting um, much more negative energy, much more violence, much more, you know, and I'm thinking that must be a, 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 because our climate right now is so much about that. I kept waiting for the next shoe to drop. I mean, these two kids escaped from a, from a, a penal institution in the back of somebody's car. I mean, it sounds like something I'd see on TV, but it was okay you know, and, and all the characters just kept being okay and helpful to each other, except for, you know, the, the one bad guy that you meant that you referenced. I just want this to be a movie because I, I think felt the same way. I felt the same movie. way. It would be a so. fun movie. I mean, there is, you know, there's obviously darkness at the end of the novel, but there's also hopefulness um, as well. And again, I don't want to give 
too much away about that. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, and I think there's something that appeals to everyone. Um, you know, maybe, you know, if you like adventure, there's certainly that. If you like some of the um, references to the classics, that's in there as well. Right. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's, it has wide appeal because of the way uh, it was written. And I'm Thanks just so curious, much. I'm sure people have read um, one or both of his other novels. Are they similar in that way? No, completely different. <laughs> yeah, they're both really serious pieces, I think, in some ways, but um, that gentleman in Moscow, basically a guy stays, stays in the hotel. hotel. Yes. <laughs> I didn't think, um, I think the gentleman in Moscow couldn't have been more different. Now I'm not going by writing styles, but I'm talking about the setting and the story itself is just extremely different. Oh, so Joan has a comment here um, that the rules of civility, which was Tolst's first book was actually offered early as a free choice for Amazon Prime customers. Ah. <laughs> so um, that even more power to them. For <laughs> oh. And I think that um, uh, the Lincoln Highway was their number one pick as the best book for uh, 2021. Amazon's that is. Uh, I don't know. They probably made some other best books lists as well and I think it's still it it came out either the end of October or early November and it debuted at number one and it's still number four or five on the bestseller list so it's had some staying power. I have a question um, and maybe it's something that I missed or maybe I'm being thinking too much about it. I'm curious about Woolies medicine um, wondering if it was, if we thought it was legitimate medicine for a problem, or if we thought it was causal to the problems that he had living his life. Yeah, maybe both. Uh, I, I tried to do a little <clears throat> um, poking around to, to figure out exactly what it was. Um, and I, I didn't come up with anything sp specific. Um, but it, I think, you know, maybe it was meant to have a calming effect. And then of course his, the other thing he had access to at the end of the novel were, uh, some pink pills, uh, of Sarah's, his sister. Right. So, um, and that might've been, I don't know, maybe the grown up version of the drops. I, uh, again, I think that I had, I was curious about that, um, too, you know, maybe, <clears throat> maybe it was a kind of ADHD, um, what is it, Ritalin now that, uh, or was prescribed at one point, maybe it's some early version of that, um, but yes, he's a very lovable, um, character I found as well. Yeah, I sort of found myself wondering if it was a family that was medicating normal behavior and had been all of his life. Because two of his relatives died right. early. Um, yep. And there's some mystery about that. Yep. Right. Yep. Good point. Anyone else? Comments or questions? Well, I, I, it, it's always more fun if it's in person. Uh, and I, I appreciate those of you who tuned in this way. Uh, it's given me um, new empathy for my former colleagues who had to do this for such a long time, uh, the first half year or so, and then last year uh, with the pandemic, um, it is not an easy <laughs> uh, thing to do day in and day out. I can't, I can't imagine 
uh, having to teach that way would totally change the way you could approach things. I had a hard enough time standing <laughs> still. So <laughs> uh, I have new appreciation for their difficulties. Well, thanks, Kathy, so much for doing it and for doing it with us so many things in our lives. Um, so Lisa pointed out, this is a beautiful segue to uh, get you to come to the next session where uh, in the empire of pain, we see the rise of Valium as the drug of the 19th <laughs> <laughs> That was a good thing to end yeah. on, I guess. Yeah, if you haven't read Empire of Pain, it's a remarkable piece of journalism. I highly recommend it. Uh, and I hope you'll join us. Yeah.